Kia ora whanau, Kepa Mewitt, back here on the Raw HQ podcast. We have episode 21 today, and we have one of the biggest names we've had so far, not only in terms of rugby, not only in terms of sport, but just in general, one of the biggest names in New Zealand and abroad, and that is the All Black captain, barring injury, of course, Sam Kane. Uh, We wanted to speak a little bit about his football, of course, what makes him tick, what sort of pathway he took to get to where he is today, what makes him successful, what he believes is the most important aspects of leadership. Obviously, he's a, a great leader of men, but I also want to talk to him about stuff outside of football because I know that a lot of people will be interested in the man that Sam Kane is, not just the rugby player. And please, if you feel inclined, check out the show notes below or the description links on YouTube to find out ways you can get involved with Raw HQ and other things that we talk about in this podcast. Cheers. This is Sam Kane, All Black Captain. All right, you ready to roll? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're nervous or yeah, not? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kia ora whanau. Uh, Kevin Mewitt here back on the Raw HQ podcast. And today uh, we've got one of the most influential figures in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> 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 now we've got uh, Sam Kane here, um, obviously All Black captain, Mighty Bay, Plenty Man. And I just want to have a little bit of a catch up with you, brother. So I appreciate your time. No, nah, pleasure. Very good to be on. Um, Long time listener, first time, <laughs> first time potty, so <laughs> good to be here. Oh, crack up. So bro, I obviously don't want that, uh, I suppose people are in your ear heaps about code and that kind of thing, so I don't want it to be all about that, obviously there's going to be a bit of a chat about, about that sort of stuff, and um, but I, I want to make sure like people get a sort of different story from you out of this so I'm going to just want to catch up about what your background is and what I guess makes you pretty successful and I've had a I guess like I had Scars on here yeah I had Les Elder on here and so a few different people that are quite good leaders bro and that's what sort of draws me to to invite you on here most of all not just the, the football side of things so let's go right back to the start bro like I'm sure a lot of people know um Rip Roar is Sam Kane country these days. Uh, so tell me about your upbringing, bro. Yeah, uh, look, just all like upbringing and from, right from a, a young fella all through school, it just got such like, positive and fond memories of it, eh? Mm. And um, I remember uh, Steve Axton's our, who was our first 15 coach, Carl Axton's old man. Yeah. Saying when we we're playing first fifteen rugby, like these are the best days of your lives, boys, and we were sort of oh, like, ha ha, like yeah, who knows, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But you think back, man, and they they were awesome times. So my parents um, are deer farmers, which yeah. is a little bit um, right, uh, is that right, bro? Yeah, oh, a little I bit I unusual. Deer, yeah. yeah, so pretty much everyone um, in Rapparo is, is dairy farmers. If you're a farmer, yeah, um, we're the only we're the only deer farm going around. Mm. Um, but both my parents grew up on dairy farms, and I think Dad sort of worked out he wanted to be a farmer, but right. not, um, I suppose, be held down by the milking times and worked out pretty early. He didn't want to be milking cows. So mm. he got into deer, uh, farming deer, just as it was sort of coming into New Zealand. You know, they used to catch, capture them uh, with nets in the bush and yeah. bring them back and farm them. And a few came from the UK, and it's just gone from there. And Right. He's he's really passionate about deer farming. I yeah. think it's two. I often say his two passions are, are rugby and deer farming. Yeah. So, um, and he's really into growing big trophy stags. So, right. You know, stags with big antlers, mm. and then um, selling them to to game parks and yeah, right. People pay to to shoot them. So, so uh, your parents are still together, right? Eh? Yep. Yep. Yeah? Okay. All right. What sort of jobs did you have around the farm, bro, when you were a young fella? Uh, some of the earliest jobs I remember getting, you know, I think being on the farm, uh, you get a good, uh, you, you get responsibility at a, a fairly young age. Mm. So I think like learning to care for animals at a young age is like quite a, a important skill. So yeah. we always had, oh, my sister had all sorts of pets, you know, we'd find a wild cat, a kitten on the farm and then that'd be our pet kitten, you mm. know, until it become a cat and... You know, we had a random dog walk up the road and you know, so we'd take care of it and it becomes yeah. our dog. Like, 
Um, we always had, you know, pet calves um, yeah. for for pet day at school, all yeah. these sort of things. But I remember um, to make or to make ends meet, mum and dad um, raised um, did a bit of calf rearing. Mm. Yeah, so that was always like an easy job for us as kids to get involved in, like feeding the calves and, mm. and helping out there. So that was always enjoyed that. And then as I got a wee bit older, um, dad had like a little bit of a contracting business okay with, um so like bailing silage uh yeah for for because he he brought a setup so he could do his own yeah and would end up going out and, and doing other people's so uh, right so i i learned to use the wrapper which would wrap up the the silage bales that you'd see yeah and uh yeah so before i even had my <laughs> before i even had my license i was driving the roads in the tractor yeah, uh, yeah. from farm to farm yeah um, right and it got to a stage where uh, your dad would always, if you got good enough at a job that um, he could effectively pay someone else to do just a good job, then he'd start he'd start paying us mm. or paying me. I got two younger sisters, but they didn't, mm. they weren't really uh, hands on on the farm yeah, as much. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, so it was good for me. Like I, um, obviously, I enjoyed doing the work, but also got um, like a bit of money out of it too, and yeah. that, that I enjoyed that part. Yeah. 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 For sure. So, yeah, I'd spent a, a lot of time in the tractor as a kid and you know, I used to be pretty sharp at it and, yeah. and love it too. Like for, for a while there, I thought when I leave school, I want to um, go so contracting, you know, I spend yeah, yeah, time in right. the tractor. But. You, you mentioned your old man, he loves he loves his farming but also loves his footy. So in terms of like your pedigree, bro, was the old man pretty sharp at footy? Uh I don't really know. I think he he played like a lot of club footy. Mm. He played for Rip Roar, but then he went into um, when they weren't sort of playing prem rugby. They have never really been playing prem rugby. When they went weren't up the playing a high level, he used to travel into Rotorua and play for Rotorua Old Boys. Oh, okay. So that he could be playing. Yeah, right. Good footy. Yeah. Um, but then yeah, so it's hard. To, it's hard to know. It's hard to get much out of him in regards to stuff like that. Um, yeah. Mum, mum said she believed like he, he would have been able to go on and sort of represent Bay of Plenty yeah. um, if he'd pursued it. Yeah. But um, he brought the farm at a pretty young age. He had a – dad had a hay-picking-up gang while he was at school. Mm. So he started up picking up hay and then collected up some of his mates. And by the time he left school, he owned a couple of trucks and would pick up um, a lot of the hay around the district. Yeah, right. So okay. like um, – I suppose he had a good work ethic young and mm. sort of brought the farm and put all his efforts into that. Mm. I think his – Maybe his highest rugby on. I think he made the North Island under 16 side. Yeah, young fella. Right. Okay. There's, a, there's a photo he's got at home somewhere. Oh, like, crap. In a cupboard. Yeah, right. But I suppose mum, because, you know, pedigree is you know, only half is your <laughs> yeah, old yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, and mum was just a passionate netball player. You know, she okay. loves netball and used to coach my sisters at netball too. Right. Um, so they're both sporty. Both sporty. People, yeah. 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 Okay. In school, t- talk to me about what your sort of, uh, I guess, like feedback was from other people or when you noticed that you were you were pretty good at footy? It was probably only, probably when I was about 15, mm. I think, when I played for the um, Bay of Plenty under-16s mm. and I was a year year young for that, that mm. group. So I was, because, you know, it goes up in under-14s, 16s, 18s. So mm. I was technically under-15s and we played. We had an awesome side, man. Um, mm. Steve Axons was our coach. We had a lot of Ripper Old boys in there, funnily enough. But we yeah. I was lucky we went through I went through a period the Ripper is such a small small place. Yeah. We went through a period where we had so many like good rugby players around the same age as me. Yeah. Which just made the rugby so much more enjoyable because we we're playing at a, at a high quality. Yeah. And I think we're fortunate to have some pretty good coaching during that time too. But that Bay under sixteens team, um, DJ Collier, who's playing um, yeah. Sevens now, he was in there. Yeah, um, right. Sam Henwood. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, wicked. I think a lot of people around Bay of Plenty will know um, the Warborn twins. Yeah. Tiamo and Tiata. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, were, they were guns. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Carl. Yeah. Carl was in that side too. Yeah. Um, oh, but, that's a freak side, right? Yeah, for, for you know, Bay of Plenty under 16 size, yeah, not bro. bad. And from there, we actually went on to win the win the final that year. It's yeah. pretty much from Bay of Plenty yeah. North, north. Yeah. Um, and they picked the... New Zealand under 17 side. Mm. It was just a like a training squad, pretty much sort of a bit of recognition for, and we had a, we did go away to a, a little camp 
mm. where they got access to some, you know, some good coaches and mm. got a bit of free kit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> feel, like you, stuff. feel like you cracked it. Yeah, yeah. But it was probably at that stage I worked out that there was only, um, so there was an under 17 side and I was still sort of under 15s. Yeah, and there was only maybe f- three or four <clears throat> players who were in that age group right. that were young and in that side. Yeah, in that squad. Is Carl the same age as you? Or is uh, he one year older? No, he's one year older. Well, but he time? might be like six six months older. Oh, okay. But because I'm born in January, I qualify. Ah, uh, I like, see. Yeah, because I'm younger on the cutoff date, so mm. we're not 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 big age difference now. Yeah, yeah. But um, that okay. was probably when I was like far out. I'm, I'm going all right. Eh? Yeah, going all right. And was Carl in that? Tent- oh, just for for a bit of context for everybody listening or watching, um, Carl and Sam, Carl has been on the podcast before, like I said, but he's another rapper all boy and you guys are, you know, been mates for forever and really, really close mates. So I sort of know a lot of, I guess, well, I asked Carl for some stories, bro, <laughs> but like, but, but the man's still captain of the AB, so we can't talk about all the stuff that you brought up, bro, but um, yeah, I'm just... <laughs> I was just about to say, he won't throw me under the bus and then hold up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it wasn't too bad, but um, I just, uh, I'm sort of interested in seeing like both of your guys' pathways, because you obviously followed a pretty similar sort of track. So was he in that NZ17 sort of squad? Yeah, he was in that NZ17 squad too. Because um, he was a monster of a kid, eh? Yeah, mate. We, um, funnily enough, I actually started off my, my early rugby as a number eight, and Carl was a lock. Right. And then, you know, Carl said he was always a, like a, a big kid for his age. Mm. I'm not saying, not like a overweight kid, but he was a big fella. Yeah, yeah. And then he had a like a real growth spurt, I suppose, around like 12 or 13. Mm. And then, so our scrum was like all out of kilter because we got this huge lock. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah so right. we'll, we'll slip him back into Search number eight. Back. Yeah. They follow, the little wife follows at number eight, we'll slip him onto the side of the scrum yeah, and that's right. how it sort of worked out. So even for a couple of years, I'd play open side and then when it became um, rep footy for Bay Plenty, under 14s and my second year in the under 16s, I'd go back to number eight. Mm. Um, but yeah, Carl was awesome at school and I think we were really fortunate to have each other and there was also another... Another good mate of ours, Josh, who we all had an am- ambition to sort of want to make it in rugby, and, and mm. we loved our footy, and we got a we got a real training like work ethic um, at from a young age. Like we'd do extra sessions outside. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about this because obviously it relates to a lot of the stuff that we, like that we talk about here at the gym. Because like I really admire the way Carl goes about his training. Like, he's always been a super hard trainer. Mm. And I know, like, with you guys growing up together, it obviously, um, that would have been part of your stuff. And I've spoken about it heaps on the podcast, bro. Every time, like, either, like, someone who's got a wicked work ethic or, like, has some leadership skills comes on the potty, they come from, like, a farming background. In, in New Zealand, anyway. Yeah. Like, it's just a, a it's, it, I guess it's a pretty obvious correlation. But I remember, bro, when um, I first come to Bay of Plenty, not to play footy, but, like, I was, like, in and around the training squad and that a little bit. And you you were only a young, young fella. I think you were 18 or something when, we, when, we, when I first met you. But you were already pretty strong and, and super fit. So what made you guys have that sort of work ethic, do you think? Oh, yeah, it's a tricky one. I think um, I first started to, I suppose, develop a bit of a love for, for training was at a quite a young age. There was an under 53 kilo rugby team. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I, not that I was a like an, a big kid, but mm. like I really wanted to make this side. It was like the first rep side that you can yeah. make. And um, so I thought, well, I'll try and I need to drop a, like a kilo or something. So yeah. Dad's was like, we'll start going for runs down mm. the farm. So... My only motivation to actually go for a run was to lose a little bit of weight so yeah, that I could right. try and make this rev side. Yeah. And then it was probably, I don't know, four or six weeks later, playing for Rip Raw, JB, um, that one of the one of my mate's dads said, oh, Sam, you've been playing outstanding rugby the last few weeks. You know, you're everywhere. Mm. You look like you're really enjoying it. Mm. And that was when the penny sort of dropped. I was like, oh, I have been going pretty good. Like, mm. I've been enjoying it. That's probably because I'm a little bit fitter. Right, because right. Because I've been running. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And then so that where it was just like, makes so much sense. Like, I'm going to enjoy my rugby more if I'm fitter. Right, 100%. So from then I sort of like, 
I started running a wee bit more. Yeah. Um, down the farm, down the road, and uh, so was was that um, the sort of mainstay in your training, the running that you used to do? Was that like the, I guess, the core of it? Uh, so that would have been, I don't know how old it would have been then. If I, was, I must have been like 11 if I was 50, mm. around 50 kilos. Mm. Um, Carl would have been about 80 kilos at that point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we were real, really fortunate just as we were coming through playing for Bay of Plenty under 14s, they, um, Bay of Plenty pre-academy started. Yes. Here in Bay of Plenty, yeah, and Dean right. Jennings was running that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they identified sort of, you know, 20 young players in the, in the 25, I don't know how many players, yeah. young schoolboys who sort of had potential. Yeah. And we were fortunate enough to get picked up in that. And right. from there, um, we just got a little bit of an insight into like training and, and weights. And because we were so far out of, <laughs> out of the way, the, the trainer said he'd, they'd be coming out often to check on us. <laughs> but he, he sort of like came out, came out, showed us a few weights, and mm-hmm. left, and didn't, didn't like, come, come back. Didn't not very <laughs> often. Nah, he yeah. might have come back once more. Yeah, right. He's going to be coming every two weeks. So, yeah. so then from the age of, oh, I reckon about fourteen, we were like mucking around with weights, mm. and uh, oh, I laugh at some of the things we used to <laughs> superset, bro. We used to, <laughs> <laughs> bro. Where, yeah. What, so did it come from the bro that's that stopped by? Did he give you like a few exercises, or was it? Yeah, the, yeah. Was it the, the old bodybuilding magazine? Or? Nah, nah, nah. He gave us a few exercises, <laughs> yeah, right. um, and then we were fortunate. There was a, one other guy, and Rip Roy is a bit of an older fella who sort of took us under his wing. He had a little gym set up, oh, yeah. and he used to help us out a wee bit too. Yeah. But even prior to that, I saved up money and um, brought weights off trade me for Is the garage right? at home. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so you you were like pretty serious about your training, eh? Yeah. From a young age, I was like driven and I knew that I wanted to be a rugby player, yeah. At the gym here, sometimes we do like, you know Nordic drops or yeah. Nordic raises for your hamstrings? But I remember when I first got into the steamer sort of squad and you, and you came into a gym session one time and I met, you were like 18 or 19 and uh, for, for everybody at home, a Nordic, Nordic hinge or a Nordic raise or whatever they're called, like it's, it's a body weight movement all isolating your hamstrings. It's a super difficult movement. And bro, I remember you doing a full Nordic like raise because usually people, you know, they like hold your heels and you just go yeah. like that. And I remember like, trying to do it I, I had no chance like limb length of doom and that but then i was just like looked <laughs> over and i seen like yeah you know, i was like hey, look this is a young fellow he's having a go here yeah. and he just <laughs> went down straight back up and i was like i'd never seen it before like i never knew anybody could do that and i was like what the fuck's going on here bro? like that's <laughs> mental to me but you must have, it must have left a real impression on you eh? bro it was yeah. bro it was such, it's a, such a vivid memory because like that's a it's a really strange movement to be that, good at. Like because you can't like naturally just you can't just naturally do it. It has to be trained. Like or not necessarily yeah. that movement. It's obvious that like you had a training regime that I, was I think, working. Well, I, to be honest, I think the biggest I'm still quite good at those. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. But right. The biggest help for me is that I'm got super tight hamstrings. <laughs> like <laughs> can't touch your toes. Like I can only really just touch my toes right, after yeah. a good stretch. Yeah. Right. Um and. Like flexibility has been like a continuous work on throughout my career, but I yeah. think like you know you got different athletes and some are tight, some are hyper flexible and yeah. sweet spot in between. But mm. um, yeah, sh- like tight and strong hammies. Yeah, bro, that's the one. <laughs> but oh, I used to laugh at some of the exercise we used to. Bro, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so there's this tiny little, tiny little gym at the only gym in Repro is this tiny little one. Is this the one I was on that documentary, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, I, know, so, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so it was an old petrol station, mm. and the guy, um, Daniel Hathaway, turned it into like a bit of a makeshift gym, pretty mm. much just for him because he always enjoyed training, but yeah. you know, other people could use it. And then at the college, there was this room, not much, honestly, not much bigger than this room. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's, yeah. And um, so we used to muck, after school, we'd just finish school and just go to the weights room, either go there or we'd, before we had a car, we'd get a ride down to this other place. Mm-hmm. And we wouldn't even plan how we were going to get home at that stage. It was like, we'll get the session done and then we'll worry about that later. Yeah, right. Yeah. I suppose being in such a small community, you know, you're like, if, if it really came down to it, you could ring mum and she'd come pick you up and drop you off. But yeah. you tried not to yeah, yeah, bother yeah. with that. But yeah. oh, we're, 
must have been on the bench press <laughs> and one of the um like really battling it out you know pushing yourself as hard as you can and one of the um, PE trainers walked past which must have been leaving the mm. knockoff yeah and saw me in there like struggling red face and like <laughs> pulled me into office the next day and said i don't think you should be doing weights like that you know you're pushing yourself that hard too and, hard yeah and i walked out of there when i found carl and josh and i was like Nah, that's exactly what we want, eh? Like, how are we going to get better if we don't push ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> the boys are wrong. And then down at that garage, we used to, um, because we weren't consistent with our training, mm. um, we'd, you know, go in spits and spats. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'd sometimes be super sore after a session because we didn't really understand that you need to build up to it. <laughs> yeah. so I remember sometimes, um, particularly when we got older, if we knew, like, we were going to be get on the piss or had something coming up we'd be like oh, we'll go smash ourselves in the gym <laughs> with super, with super bro, set bro, heavy, as, so heavy as hell squats with the heaviest lunges that we could do <laughs> and then wonder why the next day we're like Can't struggling walk. to walk down yeah. the stairs oh, oh bro, that's so good like on, like now i know if you want to get strong at squat like recover in between sets <laughs> rather than maxing out in lunges <laughs> Weighted lunges in between. Oh, that's so funny because I remember when Carl come on the podcast, I was like, tell me about your training, bro. He's like, this is what he said, bro. Oh, yeah. But I just, to be honest, bro, because it was on the gym podcast <laughs> and he knows that we're big on technique. He's like, to be honest, bro, I just go hard, bro, and it's not a lot of technique. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, fair enough, bro. <laughs> yeah. But he, he was always strong um, mm. in squats, man. He was, a, yeah, even from young age, he was way stronger than the, the rest of us when it came to yeah. lower body, eh? Yeah, right. Mm. What year, what form did you leave Rip Raw? What year Yeah, you... so the end of, end of sixth form. Okay. So it was, I suppose it was after that tournament that I said they named the under-17s that um, started getting like a bit of interest from other schools. Mm. To, and so we, um, you know, my mum's always taught us as kids to like take every opportunity that comes your way and, mm. and try and make the most of everything and, and give everything a crack and um so like sort of true that we went around and had a look at some of the schools to um express interest and mm. see what it's about um but in the end it wasn't just wasn't really like a good fit you know i was like f 15 years old um a real solid group of mates we were playing good rugby mm. at home yeah. and um we just didn't see the opportunity was worth worth me moving away right um so it turned down those um which you know looking back was a hard decision but definitely the right decision yeah. and then by the end of sixth form we're getting starting to get a little bit of um pressure but in like good pressure i don't mean like bad to uh for bay plenty to get their hands on us because yeah. like i said they weren't traveling out to rip raw to get their hands on us so yeah. we were by that stage we were actually doing um you know like sometimes getting up early in the morning to drive into rotorua to do a gym session before yeah, school yeah right yeah so we're starting to i suppose they're identifying us as guys that could be playing for bay plenty within a year or two after leaving school and mm. to do that they needed to get more sort of hands-on training so there's yeah. a bit of pressure to sort of move either to a rotorua or tauranga mm. where they were set up mm. um, but then there was also a bit of interest from um, waikato and hamilton boys yeah so, so in the end it came down between ham boys and tauranga and mm. and the real key part was that we're sort of loyal to to Bay Plenty, you know. We mm. grew up as Bay Boys, and we wanted to represent Bay Plenty. Yeah, for sure. So, was it a discussion like, obviously between you and the schools and your family? But like, did you and Carl talk together about like you wanted to go together? Oh, hundred percent. We were. Yeah, right. There's no way. Oh, we were, true. No, right. we weren't splitting up. Yeah, no. right. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, a, we're a package. So, <laughs> <laughs> bro, that's a package. So, so. Um, and at that stage, were you like established as you were seven and he was an eight? Yep. And to be fair, Carl had already played for New Zealand secondary schools. So he'd um, oh, made okay. the secondary schools as a sixth former out of Ripper Raw, which was yeah, a right. pretty special achievement. Uh, okay. So you, you, you shoot off to uh, Tauranga Boys for, for for just that seven form year, right? Eh? Yep. Yeah, right. And, and you make secondary school in uh, secondary schools in that year? Yeah, we do in the end. Um, yeah. It was a... Because Tarong Boys doesn't have a hostel, yeah, which no. a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, in that Super Eight comp, you know, all those other teams have a hostel, so mm. it, um, they can sort of not poach, but bring in a few boys from different country schools and, mm. and help bolster their side. So as it goes, and um, so we ended up living um, 
with the academy manager's partner at the time mm. who had a house at Otomodai and a little downstairs unit, which was which was awesome. It's like two single beds, a little kitchenette. Um, she'd do our washing um, and our food, yeah, grocery beauty. and stuff. Is this Dean Jennings? Yeah. Is it you saying with him? His, yeah, so he wasn't he wasn't living with us at the time. Not, oh, okay. Not when they first when we first moved in, yeah, right. Uh, and uh, well, the awesome lady Vicky Simple, she's just, yeah. yeah, she's incredible. So yeah, um, and and their kids say eh? so it was yeah. a full household, but it was it was good fun, and, and then it was on us to sort of get to trainings, which were we were pretty much training like um, academy players. You know how it yeah. is when you um, leave school. You know early yeah. morning starts, yeah. um, late evening trainings mm. while we we're going to school too mm. and yeah it took it out of us eh well, it's um, hard yeah, go back to, yeah to, the, to the point that we'd sort of because it was on us sometimes we'd just go to the gym in the morning and then uh come back to have breakfast and jump back in bed yeah yeah, yeah and uh we that. sort of got found out a, a, a wee bit um because <laughs> it was before there was you know whatsapp group messages or whatnot and the first 15 was a pre-season game we we're playing hamilton boys at Wakato Stadium before a Chiefs game, I think. Mm. So it was like pretty, pretty cool game yeah. to be a part of. Yeah. And they called a um, a session, a training session at lunchtime, just the, the forwards to go over the lineouts. Mm. And they it's, they sent it round to the class, like the, a note to the teacher, and then the yeah, teacher would tell the students right. in the class. But you fellas weren't at school. But we weren't at school, so we didn't know about it. So we missed it. And then, uh, like, fair enough, they we were put on the bench for that game. Yeah. And because um, we'd missed the training. And then my old man's like, how come you guys are on the bench? Oh. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I had to tell him why. Yeah. And uh, oh, I won't forget it, eh? He's like, because he's pretty calm. He sort of fired up on the end of the phone. He's like, you make sure you go to every single bloody class from now on. Mm. If you miss a single class, I'll pull you out of school mm. and don't think you're coming back home. Um, yeah. You can go get a job. Yeah. And I was like, oh. You wake up. Got off the phone. I was like, oh, Carl, looks like I'll be going to school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not missing any more classes. And then Carl put the blinker back on. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet brother. <laughs> oh, he actually finished with saying, and you can kiss goodbye to New Zealand secondary schools because he knew how much I wanted to make that side. Yeah, yeah. right. So um, it was like a, a timely kick up the ass, to be mm. fair. Cause, um, but it also... We had a discussion with the academy manager there that we, they were probably overcooking us. Mm. Like we were training too much, so we were too tired. Yeah. So even when we got to school, the times we did, mate, I was, we'd literally try not to fall asleep in class. Yeah. And you know, at that age, you need more sleep than normal. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I think he realised there was like a bad look on like me and our family if I'm coming over there and you know, yeah, 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 you know, just playing code and yeah, that's just it. well, yeah. yeah, not showing up. It's not, mm. not what we're about. After school, um, like we were saying before, like you come into the Bay setup, you played a bit of, and then played the full. I played the full season oh, until yeah. um, Herb Schuler, you know, yeah, like pulled us out at the end yeah, of the year. Yeah, it um, seems to happen quite a bit, bro. Yeah, yeah, you didn't get to play the final. Right? Nah, so yeah. watched it from the stands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you're in the Bay setup, and then you, you had like a because you were such a young fella, you had like a, a limited amount of games that you were allowed to play for MP, in NPC that year, right? Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Um, probably, but before that, what a lot of people don't know, I had a little like crack at sevens. So oh, straight yeah. after that's uh, right, bro. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, so straight after school, did New Zealand, the New Zealand schools, and then um, got called in, and we played a few club um, tournaments for Ripper. Mm. We had awesome, awesome little team, man. Like, like Scott Curry was playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We was so much fun. Um, we didn't take it. Like very seriously, mm. we just love playing touch. We just play a lot of touch and yeah, yeah, and just moving the ball. And you know, when you've played with guys for such a long time, which, yeah, we, yeah. which we had because we we're still still young fellas, yeah, yeah. And then so I got called into a New Zealand Sevens camp, um, and that was just a real buzz. It felt like out of the blue. I was mm. only seventeen years old still, mm. and uh, yeah, we just got flogged there. <laughs> <laughs> touch. Oh, mate, it was yeah. ruthless. Yeah, yeah, it was ruthless. Um, but from there. Uh, I got named to, to go to a tournament mm. and then for some reason they had a rule at the time you had to be 18 years old. Oh, okay. Yeah, which which is a, a weird rule which it never used to exist. Then they created it and then they scrubbed it again. So I was yeah, just... A, you just missed out. Yeah, I just missed out. Yeah. It would have been would have been awesome to have a, a New Zealand Simmons jersey but yeah. after that, 
after that stint, I was like pretty inspired to, to have a crack at sevens. Yeah. But then, as most people know, like the national sevens tournaments just after New Year's. Mm. Yeah. And as a young fellow, I was like pretty geared up for RMV. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so me and the boys, um, uh, we went down to RMV and, and go on the piss for five days, and then came back and played a sevens tournament on the second. Mm. Um, which was just gassed. It was just so gassed. Yeah. Um, I remember trying to go for a run on the first to try. So we always had a attitude growing up, like if you're going to get on the piss, yeah, you got to back it up. You got, yeah, up. or yeah. like we'd often, Carl and I would we'd often go for a run the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, just, he still does it, but it's just like that mentality of like getting it out of you. Yeah, and so I was like, oh yeah, we've been down to RMV. I'll go for a run. Nah, got like 500 meters down the road, my cars were cramping up. I was so dehydrated. <laughs> like, oh, bugger this. So I walked home, made like real healthy smoothies. <laughs> yeah, I was doing a nutrition. Oh, yeah. So I did that. And then, um, no, nah, I got back to focusing on 15s after that little stint. So yeah. easily impressionable at a young age. Just, yeah. yeah, whatever opportunity. Um, but yeah, I, I love that club season, eh? It was good mm. fun. Um, yeah. So it, sort of that first step up from playing boys from playing boys or what feels like boys mm. and you just think you know playing men's gonna be so much tougher but yeah yeah, yeah. and bay rugby's a little bit it can be a bit rough at times i suppose so it's yeah. quite a big difference from yeah, yeah clean I mean, fast school footy yeah, to like I mean, slow yeah. slow dirty buggers yeah um, yeah. yeah so uh yeah you play a little, i remember you play a little bit of npc that year and then uh I think you know stuff to, starts to gain a bit of momentum by then, eh, bro? Because you start, you know, you got twenties and mm. yeah, you, you play a lot more for Bay Plenty. You get picked up by the Chiefs, bro. How old were you when you played your first game for Chiefs? Yeah, uh, nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so Ian Foster was the coach of the Chiefs back then, mm. and we were lucky enough to play in the first Chiefs under eighteen side, mm. and uh, he went and watched those games and there was three players that he sort of picked out of that team that he wanted to um, sort of show a pathway to the Chiefs. Yeah. Um, myself, Carl Axtons and uh, Charles Piatel. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. he was our left winger. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Charles uh, Charles stayed or well, we ended up going to Auckland. Yeah. Yeah, because um, he was at Wesley College. And then, so he showed a bit of an interest in new of us coming through. Mm. Um and even got us over for a couple of weeks preseason. Um, might have been the end of that year. Mm. Yeah, we, we stayed with Alan Delmont. Slept on a, um, mattresses in his in his room. Yeah, on the floor. What a monster! Yeah, yeah it was, was awesome. You know, like yeah. young fellas living, yeah. or staying with the Super Rugby living with the big dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, well, we grew a bit of a passion for training hard early, so we were just loving this. Yeah, yeah, yeah we loved it. Yeah. And, but yeah, like you said, we um, I had those couple of years with Bay Plenty. It was after my first year, actually. I got a wider training group contract mm. with the Chiefs. Yeah, mm. so I'd only played a handful. Yeah, and then um, back then, like when you came into the club team, because it was my first year at Tauranga too. Yeah, and we took separate paths, but you know, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> but I remember, like back then, when when they said, "Oh, there's this young fella coming," and you were sort of widely known as like the the big up and coming like kid i remember someone saying it might even be mike rogers bro like our coach saying this fellow is the best 18 year old in the country and he's coming to play for us and i was like oh we'll see <laughs> <laughs> and then uh but yeah it turned out to be to be true i suppose but um first of all i just want to touch on this leadership stuff so at, at what age or at what teams did you start being part of like leadership groups or or taking over like captaincy, because obviously you got you know chief stuff now and AB stuff now. Did you was there any other teams over the years uh, apart from I guess well you you were skipper steam as last year for a little bit eh? Is that right? <laughs> uh, one game yeah uh, last that's right. year yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so that's um, poor old Rossi got injured yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so what uh, were there other teams as you were growing up that you were captain of? Majority of the time, like you only really get a captain when you get to first 15 level, or we did, we never had captains at junior, yeah. at junior rugby. Mm. I think I was, I think I was captain of the Bay of Plenty under 14s, mm. um, and then Carl was normally captain mm. of um, of our first 15, mm. and then of, 
must have been like the band of 16 and stuff. So yeah, right. I think, yeah, little bits here and there. But right. Yeah. So what do you think it is like? Because in, in this in this period of your career right now, you're the main man for like, all, all the teams that you're part of. So what do you think? Can you put your finger on a few different aspects that you think you're strong at that, that leads you to that? Yeah, I think like... Um, well, first and foremost, um, like your, your, my teammates appreciate the way like I play the game, mm. and like have have respect for sort of my willingness to to throw my body around. Mm. Um, I'm pretty calm uh, and inconsistent mm. uh, under pressure as well. I'm not like uh, I don't often spark up or, or, ye- or yell at people or anything like that. Mm. Um, I think people respect that because they they like to be. Well, that's how I'd like to be treated if it was the other yeah. way around. Yeah. Um, also, I think um, just being from from Bay of Plenty and from Rip Raw, the ability to like connect and and get along with all sorts of different people. Right. Yeah, I think from from a young age, like we, um, we're encouraged to chat with everyone and mm. elders, and then you know we've got a good mix of. Um, white boys and Māori boys here in Bay of Plenty and you sort of mm. just learn to get along with everyone. Um, so I think that that helps to sort of form those relationships off the field as well. Yeah, right. Mm. Okay. Oh, that makes a lot of sense, bro. I think, um, yeah, obviously a lot of the stuff that you're talking about relates to like, personal performance. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess all the people that I've had on here that have been leaders always speak about that, you know, first and foremost is being able to, do the things that you're expecting of other people I yeah guess, you know? because like you know in no way can you ask someone else in the team to do something if well it just carries no weight yeah if you ask someone yeah. to do something and they say right. oh, i've never seen you do that before yeah mate. bro it yeah, happens yeah, to yeah. me all the time yeah. right? <laughs> 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 no, uh, um no nah, yeah i think like that's how main that's the main way to build that sort of respect there um, with your teammates is doing those hard yards. Bro, every time I see you, bro, you got like a new scar on your face. You're always bleeding, eh, bro? Like, <laughs> I, think I, sc- match, you I bleed. think I scar badly, eh? And then, <laughs> so I think my scar tissue like flickens up. I've already had a, like a plastic surgery on. It was, what, was it like folded over or something? Yeah, there's just so much scar tissue built up on top of it from, mm. from wax. I mean, the worst thing about getting a, an eye whack for, a, say, a flanker is that you, and if you've got to play again in seven days, it's just not quite that period where it can heal. Yeah, yeah. So you've still got the stitches in. Yeah. You know going into the game that it's going to be like... <laughs> it's going to open up again. You just hope that it's not going to open up fully. <laughs> yeah. But even during that time, it's like bleeding underneath and scar tissues forming. So, yeah, yeah I don't... I just think I'll scar badly and the nature of the position, et cetera, doesn't yeah, yeah. help. Mm. Yeah. Well, like I say, bro, if you want to play a bit longer, just play soft like old Diesel, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, something else I wanted to talk about. Um, and you, you you sort of mentioned it before a little bit to do with your training you know how you're saying uh, the PE teacher or whatever was like oh, you, you, you need to like go a little bit easier right so I know like, I guess I did I, I think I did a couple of pre-seasons over the Chiefs with you guys I never ended up playing or anything but you know, I've done um, trained and played a little bit with you at Steamers and you're one of the um, guys that you know when you go into like a 80% drill or you like pair up to do some wrestling or something. This is a good thing, by the way. You're one of the guys that you don't want to be paired up with because you're like, you're full on all the time, you know, if it's like a tackling drill or something. So do you feel like you have that sort of reputation? Like, the, the, nah, it's actually not, interesting not, not, hearing not like you the, say that, yeah. Not the, um, I don't know. Some some people are like a bit of an asshole about it when it's 80% contact with training and they just want to lay someone out. Yeah. But, it's, I think, like, the way that you approach a lot of, like, the training drills and stuff, I just sort of seem to notice that you're, you're obviously very technically sound with it, but your intensity levels are always pretty high. Uh, do, do yeah, you, probably because it was I, probably because it was preseason, bro, and yeah. it wasn't sore as, yeah, the, yeah, as yeah. the season wears on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's true. Take a yeah, few bangs yeah, off. Yeah, preseason, bro, when you're fresh. <laughs> but till the end of the season, and just, someone wants to do a tackle drill with me, oh no, no not today. <laughs> <laughs> I just was cannon fodder for <laughs> pointer in preseason. <laughs> oh no, I don't know. From um, 
Yeah, I don't like, even now, I don't like that mediocre, uh, if it's contact, I yeah. don't like practicing it at like sort of half pace. I'm yeah. sort of just like, do you feel like there's, yeah, there's not I just really don't really, I don't really get much out. Of, I, I yeah. feel I don't get much out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of eighty percent. I feel like get if I can do it eighty percent, mm. so I can practice like good technique. I, um, I always found the percentage thing from the coaches to be a strange call, like at training, and right up, it's up to sixty. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, bro, what, what's the difference between sixty and eighty? Because I, I, I don't have like a marker. No, no, no. Oh, I'll just turn my dial up. <laughs> yeah, <mate. exactly. laughs> oh, no. but, oh yeah. it's the worst because it's you, like you said, someone's sixty and someone's sixty yeah. could be, and way but all off. of a sudden hundred. Yeah, because was, someone oh. someone got it yeah. in the red. When we <laughs> when we were going for the selection camp for the. New Zealand under 17s, mm. Carl and I. Mm. So they had all the people from the same region and we had to do like contact drills against each other mm. and the coaches would stand back and watch. Yeah. And you know at that age, like no one wants to smash their mates. And we're watching some of the other boys go through and they're just making like weak tackles and their mate was letting them thing. Yeah. So Carl and I stood to one side and we're like, nah bro, let's just go hard. Like you try, you try. You smash yeah, me. You, smash you run hard and I'll smash you. Yeah. yeah. Vice versa. That's yeah. us, okay? Yeah. So like when it was our turn, we like sort of lined up opposite <laughs> drills, and we just went and smacked each other, man. Yeah, it was like yeah, hey, wicked. Just set the set the intensity, but yeah. mm, we we're like, this is our best chance of getting picked, man. We got to show them. <laughs> bro, this reminds me, bro. This is so funny, bro, because. I, like in my early years at the steamers like obviously when you when you're playing npc and you're not already an established super player everybody's you're trying to get to the next level you're not there to play footy for three mm. months a year you're trying to get the full-time gig yeah. so i remember bro we, we used to be we used to have training sessions and obviously like you get the plan for the week and it'll be like tuesday's red or whatever so so it's a contact session but they'll be like um i don't know Colin Cooper or someone's coming to training and then the boy, it turns from a contact session and what we used to call it is a contract session. <laughs> so you're like, if you could get it, it's so stupid, bro, because it would never happen. Yeah, because like they're the not going to judge off one training, <laughs> eh? <hey? laughs> but the boys used to, like, a couple of the boys would be like, yep, we're on here. We're on here, boys. It's like, no, bro, just because you smash someone at training, it's not going to get you a contract, <laughs> yeah. bro. It's your game in the weekend, Yeah, eh? yeah, hard out. Oh. <laughs> and you're on the bench anyway. <laughs> 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 but, um, oh, oh, bro, so funny. Some funny memories, bro. Um, okay, yeah, let, let's touch on some uh, injury stuff. First, we'll cover off um, your neck, bro. I mm. know like it's pretty widely covered, but I want to speak to you about it um, personally, I suppose. And more, not necessarily just the physical part of it and, and getting back right again, but I want to know how you you dealt with that situation because it would have been a very sort of almost traumatic like scary situation what happened because it's yeah. when it's you know when it's starting to go from here up bro like mm. it's, it's um it, it's it's pretty heavy so what went what was going through your mind um when it first happened and then when they said like you know you've got a broken neck what how did you deal with that yeah when it first actually happened out on the field i i had no idea that i'd broken my neck i was mm. just sort of I think I'd been concussed once or twice already that year. Like, you know, I was sort of weary. I thought I'd had another concussion and had a bad stinger because I just had this intense pins and needles like I'd never had before down my right arm, I think it was. So it just felt like the worst thing you've had? Yeah, but I was sort of coming to as well. So I definitely think I'd got um, concussed. Right, I had not yeah, as well. So yeah, so I was sort of like coming around and then this pain in my arm. And then um, I was like, oh, I'm off. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So so at that stage you, you weren't really aware that like nah. that serious it was that serious no nah, no idea and um so wandered off walked off the field I remember feeling like a bit off balance as I was walking like I was like felt yeah, like I wanted but... to lean to one way it was but it was weird yeah and then they put me in a room out the back of the stadium um and they're like oh we're gonna give you some sort of some morphine I think and I was like oh no. Nah. There's no need, no need for that like I'm all good yeah like it's not that serious like, yeah we carrying on they're like yeah we're gonna send you to hospital. And I was like, oh, jeez. Like, How did they know? I don't know. Do you reckon it was just like the way you, that you went down or something? Potentially. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so next minute I'm in the hospital and um, it was on that hospital ride where I think I'd like cooled down a bit from the game, a bit of adrenaline and stuff had worn off and then it was like the bouncing on the South African roads. I knew that something wasn't right. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, no, this is, this is sore. Yeah. And then once I got to hospital, um, 
by this stage I didn't have a, a brace on or anything and I was like like sit up out of the off the bed lie down for the x-ray get back up again walk over to the other bed um, in pain the whole time but yeah. all I really wanted to know was um, how we're getting on in the test match, eh? Yeah, right. Yeah, I was like, because we were behind. What's the score? Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. the one where we scored right at the end and then <coughs> she kicked to, to win it. So yeah. um, when I found out we won that, I was so pumped with that, just stoked that the boys could do it. Yeah. Um, and then it was not long after that, um, I'd had the x-ray, nurses and doctors. There was about five or six people sort of came rushing into the room. Mm. I put the bra- this big brace around my neck and started running their fingers over my feet and stuff. What's going on here? And that's Is that, that sort of like a bit yeah. of a red flag yeah, when they're doing like, that, eh, bro? What are they doing? And I was like, I can feel that. That tickles, yeah. which is a good thing, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's when they told me that you'd, I'd broken my neck. and um, I suppose I didn't really have a, a real scary moment where I was like, because cause I knew I could already walk. Y- yeah, true. Because I could feel my feet. Yeah. It wasn't like a moment like, shit, is this going to be me for the yeah, – this yeah. is my new new normal. So, yeah. And now that I was in their care, I sort of just had the belief that it was only going to get better from here. Yeah. And it was never really too bad, even though it was very close to being bad. Mm. Yeah. So uh, when they got the, the x-ray back and they said, like, you've got a broken neck, did they say, like – were they like – you need to be still or anything like that. Like, was is it was it dangerous to be moving around and stuff? Um, no, I asked them that after surgery, oh, true. and I because I also asked what did I put myself in danger by walking off the field? Mm. Because um, and he said, nah, if you're going to do the damage, <clears throat> this was the surgeon. It would have been done an initial impact, right, right. Um, and then after that, all your muscles go into spasm and protect what you've done. I see. Okay. Yeah. So he said, like. Yeah, no, nothing, no further damage. Yeah, right. Or very unlikely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And by that state, once they're done, they put this brace around me. I couldn't move. And yeah, right. The longest night after that, because I didn't get surgery th- to the next day. Yeah, right. So they had to go through all the <laughs> all the insurances and oh yeah and stuff. And then I think they just had to get a good surgeon and, and book it in. And it was the longest night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you, like, you've had a few. I mean, you're injured right now and you've had a few injuries throughout your career i suppose so how do you approach like i guess rehab or what's your what's your mindset around injuries bro like because for some people it can oh as an example usually when people say what's the worst part of being a footy player injury is one of the first things that they say yeah for 90 percent of players Mm. right so some people are affected by a big time you know, like it, it's it's like you're take, taking away like almost their livelihood when yeah. when people are injured. So, um, what's it like for you personally, bro? Like, because it doesn't sound like you're you're, you're too phased. You were too phased by it, and it's almost as big an injury as you can get, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I think when people say that, and like I'd I'd say the same. It's the worst part about rugby is the injuries, mm. and I think um, like we love rugby because of the camaraderie and the team mm. the sport that it is and the boys and but when you're injured it's becomes a sort of individual sport pretty yeah, quickly yeah, <laughs> you know you know away. yeah, yeah. Um, so you got a lot of that to contend with and then I think it's equally as how much it sucks it sort of takes away what you love which is playing the game yeah, yeah so it's a combination of the both I, I reckon yeah um, right but I to be fair I've actually been reasonably lucky with injuries like I've played a lot a lot of footy mm. for, for both the All Blacks and the Chiefs mm. um and you don't do that without um, having pretty good runs. So I had a pretty good yeah. run for a while, and now unfortunately I've had two two major surgeries in the space of three years, which mm. which, which sucks. But um, I feel like I'm way better. I'm way, way more able to, to deal with them than I would have been if I w- was younger. Mm. Yeah, um, right. I'm just got better balance in my life, um, yeah. and just sort of maybe a bit me- mentally resilient. Yeah, you know, get a. Long term injury, and I'm, my mindset, I suppose, is is, is a looking for for silver linings and positives to come out of it. That's what I was about to ask, bro. What is the um, what is the positive side of like a long term injury for you? Uh, so I use my shoulder as an example now. So I tore my pec. Um, thought I'd only tore my pec. Got scans, realised that my shoulder was just was blown to pieces. <laughs> yeah. The surgeon was a. Uh, Oh mate, if I wasn't seeing you this year, I was going to be running into you at some point in the next couple of years. Yeah, and so look, the, the silver lining there is that I get my shoulder fixed up 
this year rather than next year or the year after, mm. um, which I consider to be bigger years than, than this year. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's unfortunate, it sucks, but um, like I've known, I've had a bit of a dicky shoulder for a wee while, so it'll be, it'll be nice to have that patched up. Mm. And then I've just got back from a trip around the South Island, so we get a long-term injury and I think, well, what can I do with this time? that mm. I wouldn't normally get the chance to do because I'd be playing rugby every weekend. And, mm. you know, one, I'd always wanted to travel to the South Island in a camper van. So yeah. my wife and I have just got back from doing that and it was awesome. Oh, so, it looks so fun, yeah, bro. Yeah, loved it, eh? We really? recommend it to anyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, nice one, bro. I, I, I had a few questions come through. Like I, I chucked out um, a little thing to see if anybody had some good questions come through. Actually, it's funny you say that stuff about R&V, bro, because Gareth Evans was like, uh, is he going to go to R&V 2021? <laughs> but that's what made me giggle when he started talking about that. But I'm um, retired. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the questions that come through a fair bit was, uh, did injuring your neck and now, I guess, with your – shoulder injury is there anything that you'll change about your game to sort of help with self-preservation long term yeah great word self-preservation so that's mm. one that's um sort of since since my neck um like i've known for a, a wee while like the, and it was probably due to the concussions mm. i had a few concussions and i've really been really fortunate i've always bounced back fairly quickly from them mm. but i look at them and it's the, the intent that i've gone in with in some collisions is just like yeah, sort of. I look back and I think, well, that wasn't a battle I was going to win. Like, why'd you go in? So, right. I'm like, sort of trying to pick, pick, pick which ones. A bit better, yeah. yeah, and again, that self preservation, you know, the worst one is if a guy was running between you and me and you and me both went to tackle him. Yeah. I, I, and the head clash around the outside. Oh, yeah, the, the, the ones where the, mm. both you guys swing yeah, around. You almost know a split second before oh, you're you do it. Hey, yeah. You're like, oh, should oh, I go yeah, for it? And I'd always be like, yeah, I'm just going to. Yeah, just do it anyway. I'll just go for it anyway. That's so bizarre, right? Yeah. That's a weird thing. But. Yeah, so um, but definitely last year, I don't know what it was exactly, but I noticed like a real shift in myself to be aware of those situations mm. and. Um, you just make the tackle rather than trying to smash them. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I've been trying to work on that. I did it at the start of the year, actually, uh, when I thought we were going to have a head clash. We were playing the Highlanders and yeah. Jonah Nuriki went through. Yeah. Um, and I missed the tackle on him. But I thought me and um, Tupo Vai were going to clash heads. Yeah. So I was like, I'll just make the tackle the best yeah. I can can yeah the old man was too strong and just powered straight <laughs> through and they scored oh but um yeah so i i I've, i hope i'm getting better at that i think um if i don't make those changes um my career could be over um mm. you know prematurely yeah yeah for sure yeah, you want to make it as long it's, as possible it's like, easy to say it it's another thing getting out onto the field and doing that's it. what i mean mm. where, like you sort of get that Oh, I don't know. It's a bit of red mist sometimes. Like once you cross the line, eh? Like the adrenaline takes over, and it's like. I'm, and by the way, I'm speaking from as if I was Sam Kane. <laughs> like this is not the way I played, brother. But I, I can see, like you know, it's just in in your blood, I suppose, to try and smoke anything that's moving. When you get drilled into us too, as loose forwards, you know, like as, yeah. as a loose forward at any level now you're like expected to be physically dominant and dominate yes. collisions and, and to do that you have to go in with a certain intent yeah and uh, you know it's about realizing you don't have to try and win every every collision yeah i want to touch on a couple of things outside of rugby for you so you've got your wife and you've got a lot of different things on the go um you've got a hissing house like didn't get invited to a great day, but um, <laughs> you know, there's a small list, I suppose. Bro. But <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to see, like, I guess what what you get up to, like, is it extracurricular sort of activities, bro, or, or what you're interested in outside of football, and and also what you're thinking. Like, this is a long way down the track, because you're still a young fella. But what what are your what are your thoughts like post footy, bro? Um, I'll, I suppose I'll go with the interests and stuff outside. of um, footy. When I was younger, I like struggled to have any because I was just so obsessed with footy. Yeah. Now I've got so many like trying to prioritise which ones I want to do. Mm. Um, so I enjoy hunting. Um, yeah. Get out for um, a bit of fishing when I can. Mm. Um, just with mates. Uh, started to get into golf the last couple of years, mm. and sort of really almost caught the bug a bit before I hurt my shoulder. Yeah, and right. Myself thinking about what, it. You, you and a few of the Chiefs boys. Or? Yeah, there's like a. 
it's, it's a funny transition. When I first came through, there was hardly anyone playing golf in rugby teams, and now there's like more guys that are playing than, than aren't, yeah. which is cool, man. It, yeah, it's it's awesome. Sure. So, um, I suppose those are more like if I've got a day off, those are the things I, I want to yeah. be doing. Yeah. I've also got a, a Harley Davidson, oh, which yeah, I used to. That's right. I, yeah. I, I, I didn't spend much time on it the last summer mm. because of that golf. Um, little did, obsession, but I remember. Did Tyler Ardron have one as well? Yeah, he had yeah, a motorbike. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, so we, it, it's handy if you got a mate to to cruise with as well. Right. It's a little bit. Anyone I, else at Chiefs or Avi's got it? Um, Tawara Kubalo did. Oh, okay. Yeah, but he was, so now uh, you're just a no, lone ranger. Lone, lone ranger, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crack up. Chuck uh, Harriet on the back and cruise out yeah, to Raglan. Yeah, mean. Um, but then, yeah, life after rugby. Um, it's been like, like you said. Um, I suppose you, you found something you were quite passionate about, and that was the the gym. Mm. Um, so for me, it's been like sort of trying to find what what gets me passionate. And I think I've only sort of come to realise in the last few years. I think that um, that's like farming, or, or, or at least having right. some some land. And and I'd love for our kids to sort of experience some of the things that that I got to experience growing up on the farm. Right. And, and my wife, Harriet, she's from a farm as well, so I'm, I'm fortunate that she's she loves that as well. Yeah. Um, I think because for you grew up on it, you almost took it for granted yes. a little bit. Yeah. And then you move away and trying to find all these things that you love doing. Mm. It's not until I got, go back on a farm, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, this this is, is pretty cool. Yeah. But at the same time, um, I feel like by the time I finished playing rugby, you almost serve like a, a 15 or 10 year apprenticeship and like studying and learning about the dynamics of team 100%. culture the game um leadership yes so um i feel like it would be a waste a little bit of a waste if i didn't use that in, in some way yeah uh, I understand plus um plus I, I love the love the game of rugby and, and love like team dynamics as well yeah. so i don't know like an ideal world i'd try to find something that i could do a little bit of both mm, yeah. um, and after after living in a city for a while i don't th- i think i'd struggle to go back to a, a small um rural community so somewhere right. it'd be closest to a city yeah love, love my coffees and no. I'm dining out of it too much now <laughs> yeah so, right. oh no that would be an ideal well that's just a little bit of a picture i've got in my head but um yeah we'll see how that go how that pans out yeah i don't want to be um like coaching by any means i don't want to mm. i don't i don't enjoy the analysis side on the computers yeah, i'm with you there bro yeah. i don't enjoy that and i don't well it's not that i don't enjoy it but i'll be well and truly over the travel in the hotels yeah I'm sort of get that state yeah you know go same places same schedule yeah so yeah. I'm, i quite like uh the idea of working with sort of like the under 19s age group or something around there okay. you know guys that are on the fringe of yeah. potentially going on and I feel like you could have like a, a good influence on there because those are actually quite tough years where you transition from out of school mm. you're trying to make it as a professional player but you're also always juggling either work and study commitments mm. and just trying to knuckle down for those few years can yeah. have a big effect on your long term yeah for sure how much longer you got in recovery on your shoulder and pick there uh, it'll be two months on Friday since surgery they reckon it's roughly Six month injury, mm. all going well. So um, it was a pretty big, pretty big job, and then it was technically four surgeries all tied up in one. Really? Yeah. So it will take a while. And yeah. Even at this early stage, it's just about getting my range of movement back. Yeah. Before starting to work on the strength side of things. So. Yeah. Um, look, our goals. I want to come back fitter and faster. Yeah. Pretty much, I think. Yeah. No. I got to sort of training age where the my my gym my strength stuff. I can maintain my level really easily, but yeah. I've got to work super hard to get much gains. Yeah. I realized that during lockdown last year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. like gymming all the time, you know, no games, so recovering well. Yeah. And just made the smallest ga- of gains in the gym. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's a lot of work for like 1% over. Yeah. yeah. So I think like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty strong in, in most things anyway. Yeah. At a good level. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to come back fitter and stronger and sort of really um, – I suppose like bulletproof some of these like niggly injuries or things that have held me back in the past. Yeah, yeah. a real focus on. I'm working on those. Yeah, mm. for sure. This question, I'll ask this last question, bro. This is one that I guess talking about these under 19s guys or these younger guys coming through. If you could have gone, if you could go back now to 
to when you were first, you know, 16, 17, you were first coming into the game um, or into the professional game. Is there anything that you would have you would have changed, or is there some sort of advice that you would give to to someone at that age? Now, it's a it's a strange question for me to ask you because you're now the captain of the best rugby team in the world. So I feel like if you if you didn't do what you did, you might not have ended up where you are. But there might be some other areas that you know could have done better, or some some advice for for these young fellows. Um, look, I don't know. Like I, I had a, a pretty pretty good run. You know, like I went mm. from and you one in one, one one sentence. I was I was fortunate with the, like a lot of my timing coming through teams because you know timing to get game time and who's around at that time. Mm. Um, and then another sense, I believe that I like put in a lot of hard work from a young age. Yes. you know, like earlier than than most, which helped put me on that um, trajectory. Mm. So I I feel pretty um, lucky to be able to sit here and say I don't think I'd really change anything yeah. or there's nothing that jumps to mind that I wish I'd done this or, or didn't do that. You know? I expect that as much, bro. I debuted for the All Blacks in 2012, um, a year after the 2011 World Cup. Mm. And they sort of brought through a, a few young guys um, sort of with an eye to, eye to the future. Mm. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty smooth wee run. Yeah. But I think like my advice for, for young people would be to – one one of the things I say is to try and be coachable, like mm. be be coachable, which means pretty much like take advice on board. Mm. Don't think you're better or, or above anyone else. Yes. So you know, people have always got stuff to offer. For sure. Um, you 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 decide with you, um, you know, what you do with that advice, but but take it on vo- on board and always have like a a continued drive and want to get better. Like never never yes. think you've arrived. Never think you're the master at any skill. There's, there's always areas that you can improve in, and, yeah. and it reinf- the more the higher up you go in rugby circles, and probably in life and whatever career paths it is, it's probably pretty similar. Like, mm. you know, guys in the All Blacks are the ones who are working hardest on their game and the most open to feedback, right? And, and wanting to get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes complete sense, bro. I'll, I'll leave it there, bro. I don't want to um, take up too much of your time. I know you're a busy man. I know. Um, I know how much the the injured guys cop promotional work, so uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to tie up too much of your time, bro. But I, I just want to say, really appreciate you coming on the podcast, brother, and um, obviously wish you all the best with your rehab and uh, for for the future of your footy. Maybe we can get you in again um, after this next World Cup, bro. What do you reckon? That'd be mint, eh? Yeah, bro. Yeah, that's us. All right, brother. That's uh, Sam Kane. All Black Captain, and that's the Raw HQ podcast uh, episode number 21, I believe. So thanks a lot for tuning in, and uh, thanks again, brother. Sweet, bro. Anytime. Love your work. Work good.